I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, I guess today is part two of an accidental series. We didn't even think we were going to do a series on Zhuangzi, but we've been talking about it, and we just kind of fell into it. Last week, we did Zhuangzi's Dead Wife. This episode, we're going to be looking at one of the most important passages in terms of what is the Tao, or sometimes uh, written the Tao. We'll talk about that later, I think. Um, right. But but first, I think it's important we go ahead and have an announcement. We're going to be switching over to, instead of a weekly schedule, putting out podcasts every week, we're going to switch over for a little while to a bi-weekly schedule. Is yeah. that the right bi-weekly word, Rob? weekly schedule, yep. Does that mean twice a week or once every two weeks? Once I every two know. weeks. Okay. I'm scrambling to I'm scrambling to finish a translation. You're That's getting right. ready. Well, not, not when I say you're getting ready to have a baby, your wife is getting ready to have a baby. This That's would be true. a very I different am... podcasting schedule if <laughs> you were getting ready to have a baby. Yeah. My wife and I are having a baby in, in a little while. Uh Rob, you're you're working studiously on that translation of Wang Go Wei. Uh, and you've got to turn it in pretty soon. So right. it's just super busy for us. So we're going to be releasing an episode every two weeks with the podcast. Yeah. Bi-weekly, that's the word, yep. Rob, should we just jump into this passage? Jump in. Zhuangzi doesn't require a lot of introduction at this point. We've kind of covered a lot of that. It's funny, it's an accident that we sort of started a series, but in some ways it's also not because you and I could talk about Zhuangzi with anybody, anywhere, anytime with great enthusiasm. We've been talking about doing a Zhuangzi series for, like, years now. I don't know why it took us this long to get to it. I honestly don't know either. So, anyway, but the passage we're talking about today is kind of like a... I don't want to say a definition of Tao, because famously in the Tao Te Ching... I'm going to start saying Tao. I hate saying Tao. That just bugs yeah, it's me. It's silly. Should, silly, should we should silly. we explain for for our uh, listeners? Should we explain why this happened? Why there some people say Taoism, some people say Taoism? Yeah, why don't you go for it? Sure. So um, Chinese, of course, is written with Chinese characters, right, Rob? Even 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 someone as stupid as me knows that Chinese folks started encount- started encountering the West about four or five hundred years ago, uh, and they were encountering these alphabetic scripts. Uh, they had Westerners, particularly uh, Jesuit missionaries, had to figure out how do you transliterate, not translate, but transliterate Chinese words into English, Portuguese, Italian, French, that sort of thing. And they came up with a, a hot mess of different systems, all of them pretty bad. Uh, and uh, the one that they landed on about 150 years ago, I think. It was called the Wade Giles system, named after two people. One of them last name Wade, one of them last name Giles. That system was the best of a bunch of bad systems. Then in the 1950s, 1960s, the the PRC came up with a much better system called Pinyin, and that's the one that dominates today. The word has and always, you know, has for for the last thousand years or whatever been pronounced Tao. But for whatever reason, in the Wade Giles transliteration system, it was pronounced or it was written T-A-O, but it was always pronounced Tao. Tao was always the correct pronunciation, even when it was written with a T. Now with Pinyin, it's spelt with a D, not a T. I hope that's not too long of an explanation. If it is, we can just cut it in post. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, it's, it's if you've lived in China as 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 I have and as Lee has for a bit, coming across Wade Giles is just weird. You're like, that's not even how it sounds. Why would you write it that way? So the same with Peking, right? It was never it was never ever in Chinese pronounced Peking. It was always no. Beijing, but yeah. it was spelled because of Wade Giles and the weird way they transliterate things. It was spelled P E K I N G, but it was never pronounced anything like that. Yeah, no one's ever said Peking. No one says that now. It's all Beijing, like you said. So, and that's kind of a long digression, but I, I couldn't help it because I had just started looking at this passage again and, and mentioned that this is, I said, is is going to be kind of a de- definition of Dao. But then I referenced the Dao De Jing, which is the the text that precedes Zhuangzi, supposedly written by someone named Lao Tzu, who probably never existed, although the stories about him are so cool that I kind of hope he, he did. Yeah. But the very, very first line in the Dao De Jing is Dao Ke Dao, Dao, Ke, Fei Dao, Chang Dao. Fei Chang Dao. Yeah. Yep. 
It's easy to memorize. <laughs> it's surprisingly complex. There's a lot of puns in there. But anyway, what it effectively means is what it, if you can perfectly describe the Tao, then it's not Tao. The Tao that can be spoken is not the Tao. Exactly. So when I say this is Zhuangzi's definition of Tao, take it with a grain of salt because he's not defining it. He's just sort of describing its effects think, and things like that. I don't think Zhuangzi would ever define anything because definitions never. mean you have to exclude some things. And Zhuangzi would never agree that anything has to be excluded, particularly from the Tao, right? Right. And we're going to get to that in, in a later podcast in the series. But I'm just going to read this passage. It's not super long. And then we'll talk about it. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm still taking this from Wing Tsit Chan's source book in Chinese philosophy. Still one of the best one-stop shop sources for Chinese philosophy. So check it out if you're interested. I'm just going to read this real quick. And I'm not saying Tao like he does because I can't bring myself to do that. Thank you. So Tao has reality and evidence, but no action or physical form. It may be transmitted, but cannot be received. It may be obtained, but cannot be seen. It is based in itself, rooted in itself. Before heaven and earth came into being, Tao existed by itself from all time. It gave spirits and rulers their spiritual powers. It created heaven and earth. It is above the zenith, but it is not high. It is beneath the nadir, but it is not low. It is prior to heaven and earth, but it is not old. It is more ancient than the highest antiquity, but is not regarded as long ago. Emperor Siwei obtained it, and so he set the universe in order. Emperor Fuxi obtained it, and with it he was united with the source of material force. The Great Dipper obtained it, and has therefore never erred from its course. The sun and moon obtained it, and so they have never ceased to revolve. The deity Ganpi obtained it, and was therefore able to enter the high Kunlun mountains. Feng Yi obtained it, that was a river immortal, and was therefore able to roam in the great rivers. Tian Wu, a mountain immortal, obtained it and was therefore able to dwell on Mount Tai. The Yellow Emperor obtained it and with it he ascended heaven high in the clouds. Emperor Chuan Xu obtained it and with it he dwelt in the dark palace. The deity Yu Qiang obtained it and so he was established in the North Pole. The Queen Mother of the West obtained it and so she secured her seat in the vast empty space of the West. And no one knows when that will that will begin. And no one knows when that began or will end. Peng Chu obtained it, and so he lived from the time of Emperor Shun until the time of the Five Lords. Fu Yu obtained it, and with it he became Prime Minister of King Wu Ding, and in a grand manner extended his rule to the whole empire. After he dies, his spirit, charioting upon one constellation and drawn by another, has taken its position as one of the heavenly stars. So, it was a fantastic reading. Rob, I should point out this is taken from... Uh, chapter six of the Zhuangzi. So we're we're definitely in uh, what's called the Nabian, the inner chapters. So if Zhuangzi was a real person, he probably wrote this. Yes. So this is also one of the readings of things I like about this passage. It's, it's kind of ground zero for all of the future Taoist mystical characters in Chinese fiction. Whenever you see spirits, demons or spirits basically anything involving mystical power somewhere in the in that in that story there's bound to be a Taoist priest somewhere and if you just read bits and pieces of the Tao Te Ching you can kind of go where are they getting this from this is so it feels weird. a little bit like someone someone was smoking something right yes yes then you read this and you go oh interesting so one so Lao Tzu's direct sort of descendant intellectually speaking anyway wrote this. So the the idea is if you are able to obtain the Tao, and by obtain, he doesn't mean here, you, you know, you get it, you own it, possess it, control it. In, in some sense, it maybe gets you. Anyway, if you're able to obtain it, basically anything is possible. Anything whatsoever, according to this passage in Zhuangzi. Physical laws either don't apply to you, or you're so in tune with physical laws that they can simply be that they can just be used to their fullest advantage. If you personally could define the Tao, how would you do it other than this this thing? I mean, it's it seems so weird. We were joking before about Zhuangzi never giving a definition because defining something inevitably involves excluding something. But if we think this is a definition, Zhuangzi here has found a way to define the Tao that is not excluding anything because it's all encompassing right it you know it's the nadir 
but it is not low. It's the zenith, but it is not high. Uh, you know, like those those two things, if we were to look at the definition of nadir, it's the lowest point. But here the Tao is both the nadir, but it's not low. It's the, the zenith, but it's not high. Zenith being the highest point on a on an arc or something like that. Uh, is this even really a definition or is it such a, is it so all encompassing of a definition that it doesn't really function as a definition? What I always see in Zhuangzi with talking about the Tao is you can't know what it is. You can only know what it does. Um, it's like saying, it's like the wind, which is another metaphor he uses occasionally for it, but you can She's see the, like the wind. Move. I know, right? She's Blowing like the, the wind. wind. We could sing so many songs and shouldn't really for the ongoing joy of our listeners. Please don't listen and, to And for copyright reasons. And for copyright reasons. Yes, that too. Although somehow I doubt if I started singing Blowing in the Wind, Bob Dylan would come after. I, I was singing Chinese She's Like the Wind, not not Bob Dylan. I know, but I was in my head okay, singing fair enough. Blowing in the Wind. Fair enough. You can, see, you can see wheat moving under the impact of the wind, but at no point can you point to something and go, ha, that's the wind right there. You just feel it. You know it's moving, and that's as, that's as, as good as you can, you can do. And that's kind of like the Tao here. The Tao, that's a, that's a great point. Tao is frequently defined or imagined by Taoist at, in terms of wind. Wind is something that we kind of bracket in our head as a, a, a thing. It's something that exists, yet it doesn't really exist. It's just energy flowing through a bunch of different things that has an effect but it it doesn't have a physical form right right and the other one i think about is some of the medieval and post-medieval christian definitions of god in that there's this there's a strain of thought running through christianity that says the moment you say what god is with our human language you sort of point to what god can't be because if i say god is good that means that the word good and all the things we associate with it can somehow encompass God. That's that's the argument from the, the medieval Christian perspective. And that's impossible. God is eternal. God exceeds all language and all ability to describe. Therefore, you can't explain God whatsoever. You can describe some of the things that God does, but that's that's as far as it can go. And that's kind of a useful analog because the difference, I think, with something like the wind is that there's a very limited scope of what the wind can do in terms of power, right? There's there's things you can do with the wind, but the Tao is everything. It's all fo- it's all all possible everything, or the effects of everything. We kind of just have, you know even just sort of bandying about descriptions. It's nearly impossible, but it's so difficult. <laughs> it's so difficult. But you know one of the reasons I picked this out though is to bring this up is. This far back, the Tao was not something you just sort of relax and let happen. You were supposed to pursue it. You were supposed to seek to obtain it or to be obtained by it. Something for the purpose of having power. Now, I think Zhuangzi's definition of power is a little different than what we might be used to using. But all the examples given here are incredibly bad. It sounds like sounds like, like a superhero roll call, right? Rom. You use the word power, uh, and, and I think that brings up a good point because I'm thinking in terms of physics, and you know, power is produced by energy. Would it be fair to, if we were to translate Tao into a sort of modern vernacular, would it be fair to just call it the energy, sort of the the ever present energy that's flowing throughout the universe? Possibly, uh, you know, with with the advances advances they've had in. in quantum mechanics and all the varying disciplines that branch off from that in the last couple of decades there it, it feels sometimes like that modern physics is getting to exactly what you just mentioned and going back to the Tao. i mean there's there's a there's a commonly accepted not even belief that i mean i've heard it's sort of the new this is it this is what physics is about that what we think of as actual particles also are not that's not really what it is they're that they're a part of a a field of energy. And when you say you see an electron, what you're actually seeing is that that field, which is forever vibrating, suddenly stopping. Like you're using your measurement tool and you catch one bit of that field and that little bit is the electron. 
So it begins to sound a little more like that. Like every single thing you think you see is actually something much bigger, a part of something much bigger. In fact, there may not even be discrete objects in the universe, just fields of energy, right? There's a book called The Tao of Physics by Fritjof Capra. It's complete doo-doo. I've, I've read bits and pieces of it. It's, it's, it's absolute nonsense. But I think that the larger point that there is this connection between physics and Zhuangzi's version of Taoism is something that's worth uh, looking at. And, and for those of y'all, and I know there are some listeners who are interested in physics, it's interesting to think about Zhuangzi and, and Taoism and what it says for our modern sciences. And if you believe science cannot advance into new fields unless philosophers have thought through the mechanics of those, which there are branches of philosophy who think that you can't have uncertainty until you have like until you have Nietzsche, right, Rob? Something like that, yeah. There is the suggestion that first philosophers must think through the implications and then scientists can can sort of do an application of them. Maybe it would be of interest to to those of y'all who are concerned with science to to read the Zhuangzi. Yeah. But the passage we're talking about is relatively short, very hard to pin down. I brought it up because, like I say, it introduces the notion of Tao being connected with power, individual power. So imagine that you read this passage and you were hanging out with Zhuangzi and you went, okay, but seriously though, like what does that even mean? None of that makes sense. Can you please just write something that kind of fleshes that out a little bit? Uh, the next two podcasts we're going to do are going to be focusing on passages that, for all intents and purposes, do that. I also think it's interesting that Zhuangzi feels it necessary at the end of this passage. Like, So at the first part of the passage, you have a definition. The next part, you just have him listing people from uh, sort of mythical Chinese history who are using the Tao. I think that's that's kind of interesting for me. Uh, why he he even feels the need to justify it. Uh, it doesn't strike me as a very Zhuangzian move. Obviously it is, because Zhuangzi did it, and and he knows his thinking better than I do, of course. But it, it seems it seems almost like, I, and maybe, maybe people will pillory me for saying this, but it seems almost like a Confucian move to justify what you're doing and your definition in terms of the ancients. But I don't know that I see it as justifying it. I think there's a there's a, a tradition in, in Chinese thought and writing that goes back a long way earlier than Zhuangzi even of quote unquote defining something through examples. Not defining something and then giving examples, but the the example is the definition. And so here rather than say, let me tell you all about the Tao, he goes, I don't have to. You know all the stories about these people, right? Right? Remember this person and this person? Right. Well, that was the Tao. So when he says, for example, Feng Yi, river immortal, obtained it and was therefore able to roam in the great rivers. Tian Wu, a mountain immortal, obtained it and was therefore able to dwell on Mount Tai. These are not unknown stories. These are stories people are going to know. And so this is his way of using knowledge that people already have to educate them on what the Tao is. Like, I don't need to tell you what it is. You already know what it is. You've read these stories, right? Well, there you go. That's it. I, I see what you're saying. I, I think he's embodying the the Tao in these particular characters who are already known entities, right? Right. But if he's saying that the Tao can't be embodied, that it can't be spoken, Tao ke Tao, Fei Chang Tao, uh, then then it seems like a weird move because he is doing the thing that he says is impossible, right? Insofar as there is a definition, this is a weird one, right? Tao has reality and evidence, but no action or physical form. It may be transmitted, but cannot be received. It may be obtained, but cannot be seen. It is based in itself, rooted in itself. None of that says, look, man, if you just work hard, you too can have Tao. It's, there's something happening here that isn't a definition, it isn't justification, or even explanation. It's almost like him saying, you're never going to really understand. You can, just, you can have it or you can't, right? It's kind of like coolness, right? If it's you kind of like coolness, but if you have to explain it, if you have to explain what coolness is, then you obviously don't have it, and it's not one of those things you can work to have. You either have it or you don't. Right, and that's and I think that's a good way to put it because 
uh, you know, you mentioned why would he why would he define it? Why would he explain it? Well, he's not. I mean, <laughs> the first three sentences here are about as far from an explanation or definition as you can get. He's saying uh, it has these things, but also doesn't. And then you can do this, but also you can't. Right? You can you can get it, but you can't transmit it. Well, if you can obtain it, but you can't transmit it, how are you supposed to obtain it? Because no one can give it to you, right? No one can transmit it. So how are you supposed to obtain it, right? He he sort of pulls the rug out from under his own sort of formulations here. So he's still not speaking the Tao. He's sort of saying, here's how you know someone has the Tao or is walking with the Tao in the Tao, whatever. And that's about the best I can do for you because that doesn't have a definition. Rob, I think that's a pretty good place to end it. We'll just we'll just define Tao as coolness. It's something that you it. I love you it. know you know you have it if you do have it, and there's no way for you to get it if you don't have it. <laughs> that's exactly right. If people want more Chinese literature podcasts, where should they check us out on social media? We're always on Twitter, uh, Chinlit Pod. And uh, Gmail, we love getting emails, Chinese Literature Podcast at gmail.com, Patreon, Chinese Literature Podcast. Those are the best ways to do it. Awesome. And again, just a reminder, we'll be going to a bi weekly schedule uh, from here on out for a little while. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.